Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is part 30. I think it's secretly part 31, actually, but it's part 30 of the Bodhisattva Akshayamati Sutra. Um, part 30 means we've been at this for a while. And we are indeed drawing to a close. So I want you to know it, it, it's coming to a close, but we have one more topic to discuss. And so in this journey of the Bodhisattva, this is what the sutra is about. It's about the, the Bodhisattva path, about the journey of the Bodhisattva. And in this journey, as has been described to Bodhisattva Ak Akshayamati, this inexhaustible intellect Bodhisattva by the Buddha. There's a lot to the, <laughs> there's a lot to the Bodhisattva path. Um, and I don't wanna, I, I wanna get to the topic tonight, which is this, this idea of a Dharani. That's the topic tonight. So I do not wanna diverge uh, too much from that. B but the idea here is, is that we're at the sort of the end of the sutra and just to dive right back in, let's, let's just do it. Let's just dive right back in. And in fact, that's actually how the suture goes. It just keeps moving right along. And what I mean by that is, is that towards the end of this sutra, the Buddha has been telling the Bodhisattva that as they progress through these 10 stages, they will have a su succession of visions. They will develop a succession of qualities or virtues. Um, they will, as we found out in the last few sessions, they will attain 10 successive samadhis, these very, very deep meditative states that we've talked about now for a few weeks. After describing the 10 samadhis that correspond to these 10 stages, the Buddha then says, furthermore, bodhisattva, a bodhisattva abiding in or having attained the first stage will attain the, and if we're reading our standard English translation, the Dharani of superior blessings. And there's nine more. There's nine more. I've written the first one out here with the lofty goal that we will actually talk about the first of these. But before we, before we talk about this, <laughs> Before we talk about that, we got to understand what a Dharani is. And this is actually where a sutra like this is very tricky because they're not going to tell you what a Dharani is. They're going to tell you that the Bodhisattva, uh, that who, who abides in the first stage, they're going to tell you that they attain this particular Dharani but they're not going to tell you what it is. And actually, if you go looking around for a definition of what this word, a Dharani, if you go looking around for what it means, ooh, good luck. It's an elusive term. In fact, if I can quote from Jan Natier, one of the you know, finest Buddhist scholars in the world today, she will have us know that the word Dharani is surely one of the most misunderstood terms in the Buddhist lexicon. <laughs> so that's foot, footnote for uh, 549 from her awesome book on the Bodhisattva path, one of many, by the way. So this idea that we're going to talk about tonight 
is one of the mis most misunderstood ideas in Buddhism. It's one of the most mysterious ideas. And it begins, first of all, with a sutra like this that is not going to explain what these are. And so that's sort of the first place is that these sort of are, are a mystery to begin with. So before we dive into the first of these, we got to know what a Dharani is to begin with. And, you know, if a Buddhist scholar of the caliber of Jan Natier says that this is one of the most misunderstood, <laughs> then it's one of the most misunderstood topics. And so tonight is just the beginning of a kind of discourse on this idea but I'm here to just relay a bunch of information. I'm not here to clarify anything on this note. It's just one of those topics. In fact, in fact, it's one of those topics that somebody like me would go to graduate school all the way to a PhD program at Princeton University to study Dharani. And so tonight, is a very kind of special night because this is a topic I supposedly know the most about <laughs> in, in a way. Um, and so if you don't know, and I don't actually, I don't want to make tonight about me. <laughs> everybody that knows, everybody that knows me and that's been coming to Dharma doors knows I don't care to discuss myself in that way, only to the degree to which it's helpful in that sense to all of us. And so when I get to talking about myself tonight, which I, I might do, I want you to know it's only to, to sort of explain and talk about the world of Buddhist studies. That's, you know, the world of academic Buddhist studies, which many of you know, that's where I come from originally, a, a much more scholarly academic background. And I only sort of in the last 10 to 15 years sort of drifted away from that world, but I used to be very much in that world. And in fact, just to give you a quick uh, synopsis of this journey of mine, um, I, I actually started my uh, uh, college, I guess they call it right after high school. Um, I actually started my higher learning um, at a community college. So at a very small uh, community college, actually where I live now, ironically enough, interestingly enough, I've moved back to where this all started. So in San Luis Obispo, California, there's a tiny community college called Cuesta. I went to Cuesta for a few years and that's where I took my first course in world religion took my first course in like philosophy, took my first course in a number of different things that sort of set me on my journey of, as it were. Um, but I wound up actually getting my uh, bachelor's degree from Hunter College, which is in New York. So I did a couple of years of community college in California, but then went to New York to Hunter College. And that's where I became a religion major and started really studying um, very rigorously all these different religions, taking classes in different religions. And it's where I gravitated towards Eastern religions, Taoism and Buddhism primarily, started studying Chinese language in college. And then I went to the University of Hawaii for two years to get a master's degree. This is after I got my bachelor's degree. And I mention this only to relate to you that because I was studying the Chinese language, <clears throat> studying Buddhism primarily, I wound up in a Buddhist studies program at the University of Hawaii. And what I was studying, and, it may, and it's what my master's thesis turned into, I was looking at the, the way that the, primarily the Zen Buddhist traditions, but actually a lot of Chinese Buddhist traditions, I was looking at the way that the Chinese adopted an, a foreign Indian monastic Buddhist tradition. And so I studied all the rule books of being a, a monk or a nun. I studied both the uh, monks and the nuns of medieval China. 
and was figuring out like what did the Chinese feel was dispensable and what did they feel was indispensable. And that was kind of an interesting study to do. But the thing you learn, the thing that you learn about monasticism, especially in China, the thing that you learn in graduate school, especially, is that, you know, it's, I mean, it's a long, complicated thing that I don't want to actually get too into, but you realize that these monastic institutions in, say, the medieval world, they really are and were the ivory tower of Buddhism. And what I mean by that is, is that what I was studying during my master's degree was the exalted version of Buddhism, the the ideal version of Buddhism, the, you know, all of these ideas. It, it's very almost artificial at that point because you're studying almost kind of pure scholasticism. And so when I got my master's degree and I was looking for a PhD program, I was looking for a doctoral program, and I was also kind of looking to kind of move my studies in a slightly different direction. And so I wound up going to Princeton University in New Jersey, uh, going to their doctoral program. But what I was going to study and what I wound up studying was the, the world of, well, in the shorthand, I would say the world of Buddhist magic. But what I meant by that, or what I mean by that is I was very interested, and this wasn't like me being like, oh, this is interesting. It was like a burgeoning field of study, which is, it would be called popular religion. Kind of like, what are people actually doing? Not what are they supposed to be doing? Not what are they doing at the ivory tower? But like, what does this actually look like in practice? And Buddhism in practice in medieval China was very magical. <laughs> in fact, the world seems to have been very magical <laughs> basically between the years of around six or 700 AD to about 11 or 1200, like what we call the medieval period in Europe or in China or in Asia, that was a very magical period. And so I was interested in looking at the role of the Buddhist monk, often the nun as well, but the monk or the nun, the monastic, but as shaman, as wonder worker. And indeed, there's a long tradition of Buddhist monastics functioning as uh, fortune tellers, magicians, all kinds of things. And I was very interested in that. Again, it's a very kind of well understood phenomena that the medieval period was very magical in that way. And so you get a lot of different medieval studies dedicated to looking at what we would call magic in that sense. <clears throat> um, so that was the focus of my uh, going into Princeton was, oh yeah, I wanna look at the, the monk as wonder worker, the monk as magician, uh, or uh, monastic, because again, I was very uh, aware that this was a male and female role in that sense, but the monastic as wonder worker and all of that. And if you go into that field of study, the world of Buddhist fortune telling, uh, prof like uh, prophesying in that way, a really, really, um, important function of the Buddhist monastic in the medieval world, a very important, important function of the monastic uh, was a rainmaker. So doing rain uh, rituals to make it rain has been a very big thing for a very long time. It's, I think it's one of those things that in the modern world, we completely dispensed as um, you know, magical thinking in that way. 
And so there really needs to be a good study of rainmaking rituals because it's a very pr prevalent thing. And again, it was one of the things that Buddhist monks would do, monastics. So if you go looking at the Buddhist monastic as wonder worker, magician, uh, diviner, all of those, you're going to find one idea that just keeps coming to the foreground, and it's the idea of a Dharani. And so it is that the word Dharani, the idea of a Dharani, is very often translated as magic spell. That that's what it is. And I, tonight, we're going to get deep into Dharanis. I'm going to Re relay a bunch of information to you that I've learned over the years. But right away, we're going to encounter that there's a very close relationship between these Dharanis and mantras. And so you've probably heard this word mantra. I'm kind of hoping that you've heard it. So I don't have to tell you kind of the whole backstory in that way. But the idea is, is that even way before Buddhism, way before the Buddha, in India, primarily in this Sanskrit language, but not limited to Sanskrit by any means, there is the idea of a mantra. A mantra is a word or a syllable that is considered to have power, efficacy. It could be chanted. And in that sense, a mantra is a chant. But a ma the mantra is the word or the syllable that then is going to be repeated. And again, this is not a Buddhist idea to begin with. This is a very, very old Indian idea, which is certain words, certain syllables, certain combinations of syllables have power have different qualities than other syllables other words certain words are powerful in that way and they're considered mantras and the recitation of a mantra can be a meditation practice it can be a concentration practice it can be it can be a lot of things actually and i'm not going to um i can't I can't do the whole history of mantras too. So I need to just hope that when I say the word mantra, you're like, yeah, I, I basically know what a mantra is, a recitation of a sound or a word or something. And that it there's a reason why somebody would do that, right? It would have efficacy. Again, I don't wanna get into, I, I don't even would claim to know the efficacy of mantra recitation in that way. I could talk to you about a bunch of different possibilities, but I just mean to say that if you're familiar with the idea of mantras, a dharani is very related to that, but they're different words and therefore they are different ideas. But what I wanna talk about tonight is, wow, this is such a complicated subject and it's very complicated because it's like the, the, a Dharani, and I, I'm going to give you my best guess at what a Dharani like is, and certainly I will be speaking to what I think it was originally, what was the original idea of a Dharani. But at some point, it did become synonymous with magic spells and then became almost entirely about magic spells, meaning, um, well, just let me just leave it at that for now. And, and all of that, a transition, you know, from this original bodhisattva attainment of a Dharani down to a magic spell that was a process that probably took hundreds of years and it was established by the year 500 600 easily ad then we're gonna have a good 
you know, you do the math 1500 years since then of change and progress and development to where we're at now 2021 so what i mean to say is is that the this idea of a durrani the original meaning of it seems to have been lost a long time ago and it seems to have become this kind of magic spell business during the medieval period and then after around 12, 13, 1400 or so, the world seems to have started to uh, outgrow its magical medieval period. And then these Durranis are completely relegated to like obscurity. It's just like, I, I, I don't know. It's just that they have a long complicated history. And what I'm gonna be trying to talk about tonight is where I think these come from, what I think they are, and how they become this idea of a, of a magical incantation, all right? So the first thing that I want you to know is that within the world of Buddhism, a Dharani, it's, it's actually one of the few, it's one of the few ideas that is unique to the rise of Mahayana Buddhism. You will not find the word Dharani in the Pali Canon. You will not find its Pali equivalent. And you won't even really find the idea of a Dharani in the Pali Canon and all of that. So the first thing that's interesting about Dharanis is that they are an exclusively Mahayana idea. And they are, in addition to that, kind of exclusively about the bodhisattva path within the Mahayana tradition. Okay. So that's interesting right away. I mentioned this a lot that, you know, ooh, even like ideas like samadhi. We spent a few weeks talking about samadhi. Samadhi, of course, is a pre Buddhist idea, it's an early Buddhist idea. And then, of course, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition takes that idea of samadhi and they sort of take it a little further. They take it in a slightly different direction because the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is thinking a little differently than the early Buddhist tradition. But again, samadhi, you will find a samadhi in the early Buddhist tradition. You will find definitions of samadhi. Ideas like emptiness, for example, shunyata, shunya, you will find that in the Pali tradition. You'll find that in the early Buddhist tradition. And then there's a way in which the Mahayana takes the idea of shunya or shunyata and takes it even further. But it's an original idea of Buddhism. This Durrani business, though, is something new. So let that be said from the beginning that this is a kind of a exclusively to the Bodhisattva path. And well, I guess, you know, it, it's sort of the, it's the traditional way to do this. So let's do this. And I, I, yo. Um, I, I just had a quick, so, um, so you're talking about Durrani I'm thinking a really good example would be Milarepa. M Milarepa does the Durrani and he learns it and he does the Durrani and then the snow um, cascades over his aunt uncle's house. And then that's like a good example of like a Durrani, right? Like Tibetan Buddhism, Milarepa, life, the life of Milarepa. That's indeed exactly what we're talking about. The one of the things that's going to be fun about tonight is that, you know, if you're familiar with, say, Milarepa, the, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Vajrayana tradition, that whole tradition, meaning the Vajrayana Tibetan style of Buddhism, is a few, at least a few hundred years after the sutra that we're talking about, after these ideas. My point is, is that the, the Durrani of which 
Jason just spoke about. Yep, that's a Durrani. Yep, that's what we're talking about. But actually tonight, what we're getting at is where does that come from? Where does that practice and tradition of Buddhist incantations that are magical? And let me be clear, when I say magical, what I mean is, um, you know, and, you know, magic is a whole field of study, so I don't mean to reduce it so, but I am talking about non-physical efficacy by which I mean you can affect change over there without going over there because you could do something over here. Usually if I want to affect something over there, I need to go over there and affect it with my hands, with my body, with my karma in that sense. And not to say that we haven't escaped karma with Dharanis, but what we are talking about is a kind of magical efficacy where we are affecting change in the world, similar to the Milarepa story Jason just re uh, relayed, we're affecting change in the world, but through non-conventional means and primarily through the voice. I do have a lot to say tonight about how Dharani become written, how they become actual uh, written things, but the original idea of a Dharani is definitely very much about the spoken word, which is their relationship to mantras. So, so again, regarding Jason's uh, relaying the Milarepa story, that's where this is headed, but we wanna know where did that come from? Where did that tradition come from? And actually where it came from was this original idea of bodhisattvas, at a certain level of progress, attain these Dharanis. And that word attainment, of course, is very important. I mentioned this last week, that this word samapati, a samapati is this, well, it's what I'm translating as attainment. It's what most people translate as attainment. But this is sort of like a spiritual attainment. And if you remember, or if, and if you weren't here, when we spoke about samadhis, uh, this sutra that we're reading mentioned 10 different samadhis that the bodhisattva um, uh, experiences, I guess, but 10 different samadhi states that the bodhisattva experiences upon the succession of these stages. But those samadhis are considered attainments they are signs of progress. They are signs of cultivation. So the idea is, is that these samadhis that we talked about last time are attained by the bodhisattva because of all of this other work that the bodhisattva has been doing in the paramitas, say practicing generosity, the first paramita that corresponds to the first stage. So that's the idea of a samapati, an attainment. So a samadhi, as a samapati, a samadhi is a mark of achievement in that sense. These dharanis are also considered samapati. They are also considered attainments. And that's interesting. That's interesting in terms of looking at them in their original meaning. So I already mentioned that the sutra that we're reading, it's one of those Mahayana sutras that assumes you already know. You already know what a Dharani is. And so you'll be excited to learn that the Bodhisattva in the first stage achieves the Dharani called superior blessings or something like that. We'll, we'll get to that at some point. But let's go back then and try to find the, the source. Let's go back and try to find the original, the origin of these Dharanis. And if you want to know what the origin of the Dharanis are, and I don't mean the origin of the Dharanis, I mean where the Buddha talks about them more explicitly. For that, you're going to have to jump over to your 
large Pranyaparamita Sutra, right? So this is the uh, two, um, the 18,000 line Pranyaparamita Sutra. Uh, this is the English translation by Edward Konza. And if you were to jump over to chapter, and you, I don't, I'm not suggesting you actually jump over to chapter 15 or whatever, but if you were to jump over to chapter 16, chapter 16 of this giant mother of all sutras is called the entrance into the Dharani doors. And this is one of the earliest references to Dharanis in that way. And it's an interesting chapter. Um, by the way, if you've not read the larger versions of the Pranyaparamita Sutra, they do talk about the stages. They talk about the 10 stages. And so chapter 16 is actually about preparation for journeying through the stages. And it goes through, oh, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness are the first thing. That's classic Buddhism, right? Meditation on the body, sensations, mind states, and dharmas. Then it goes on to talk about the right efforts, also classic Buddhism. In fact, if you go through all of this, it's classic Buddhism. Except for as it starts to get into the end of the, the various, it, they call it the equipment or the supplies of the bodhisattva. So when you get down to the end of the supplies, the end of the equipment that the bodhisattva is going to need, one of the last thing are the dharanis. And this is all the Buddha says about the dharanis. So he's talking to Subhuti. Most Pranyaparamita sutras are given to the elder Subhuti. And he says the, dar the Dharani doors, these Dharanis are the, are the Mahayana of the Bodhisattva. They are the great vehicle of the Bodhisattva. And what are they? The Dharanis are the sameness, the equality of all letters and syllables the sameness or equality of all spoken words. They are the syllable doors, the syllable entrances. And what are these syllable doors? What are these syllable entrances? <clears throat> and then the Buddha says that the syllable, uh, we would probably say the syllable a, but it's the syllable uh, is a door to the insight that all dharmas are originally unborn, unproduced from the very beginning. Anupatas, anupata. Then the Buddha goes on to relate a teaching as it pertains to the syllable r, to the syllable pa, ch, na. L, D, B, and the Buddha actually goes through all 42 syllables of, it's not Sanskrit exactly, but for tonight, we can just call it the Sanskrit alphabet. The Buddha goes through all 42 letter, letters of the Sanskrit alphabet <clears throat> and explains that they are a Dharani and that that syllable embodies the teaching of and each of the 42 syllables are related to a different teaching, which is to say a dharma. And that's kind of it. The Buddha says a little bit more, but it doesn't really make it any clearer than that. <clears throat> but that is one of the original references to Dharanis. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I can tell you from the get-go is that there is a very, very, very close relationship between Dharanis and the alphabet. Now, the, to use, I, I hesitate, I pause before I say that, 
because the alphabet is, that's what we know in a sense. So, you know, and, and this pertains to the alphabet. And I actually mean now the English alphabet. In other words, Dharanis are about language for sure. There's no getting around it. Um, they may become eventually magic spells and all of that, but the, the root of a Dharani, and I don't mean the magic spell aspect, but I mean the root of the idea of Dharani is that it's about language, <clears throat> but there's something more to it than that. So when, when one is confused about the contents of the Mahapranyaparamita Sutra, when one is confused about Mahayana Buddhist ideas, one turns to the Mahapranyaparamita Shastra. So that of course is the famous encyclopedia of Buddhism written by the famous Buddhist monk Nagarjuna and what the Mahapranyaparamita Shastra of Nagarjuna is, is a giant commentary on this sutra, on the Mahapranyaparamita Sutra. And because this is like the mother of all Mahayana sutras, every idea that you could imagine in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is in the sutra. And because it's in the sutra, it is commented upon in the Mahapranyaparamita Shastra of Nagarjuna. And so in the, which I just have a printout of the section on Durrani. I didn't, I actually am I'm not fortunate enough to own a physical copy of the Mahapranyaparamita Shastra. But there's a variety of definitions of Durrani that are given the first of which is the actual etymology of the word dharani. The etymology, the Sanskrit etymology of the word dharani, the root of it is dar, to have or to hold. It's the same root as dharma. In fact, dharma and dharani are very related. So there's the dar part of it and a darani. Well, I'm not the world's greatest Sanskritist. I actually am much better in Chinese language than Sanskrit. But if you go looking in, the, in enough dictionaries and digest enough information, you can deduce that the ending of that word, so not the dar, but so not the dar, but the anni part, the little last part, it actually does have to do with sequencing, things being in sequence. So what I mean is, is that, um, and by the way, get ready, because there's gonna be a lot of reference material coming at you. And so if you're interested in reference material, I'm gonna be mentioning it very quickly. There's a really great book that I really like <clears throat> called In the Mirror of Memory. It's a collection of essays. So it's a bunch of little essays, which also makes it fun to read because they're small. This isn't a, a big book in that way. And this is a bunch of essays about the idea of memory in Buddhism. So if you're interested in memory and interested in Buddhism, this might be a book for you. And there's one, actually there's two really good, three really, no, the whole book's really good. But there's a, a few really good essays, one of which is actually about uh, matrika. And this word matrika, it's a Sanskrit word matrika, it's, but it's where we get the English word matrix from. Matrix is from Sanskrit matrika. And in Buddhism, the matrika, 
the word matrika is an interesting word unto itself, but it referred to the various lists of all the Buddhist teachings. You know, four noble truths, five skandhas, six consciousnesses, seven factors of enlightenment, eightfold path, you know, the lists. So there's this really interesting tradition in Buddhism of memorizing the lists of dharmas. And within the tradition of the matrika, so remember that matrika, matrices, matrika are all these lists of teachings. And if you're familiar with a list like the Eightfold Path, right, you may know that within that list, take, for example, right effort. Right effort actually consists of a list of the four right efforts. And so there's a list within the list. So matrika in Buddhism, the matrices, were originally the lists of lists within lists within lists within lists. So that kind of way of thinking, lists within lists, and a way that a particular list might contain a list that contains the list, right? That way of thinking seems to have been the origin of the Dharani. And what I mean by that is, is that the original idea of a Dharani seems to be, according to Nagarjuna's Mahapranyaparamita Shastra, Dharani's seemingly, and this is pretty undisputed, in their original form, they definitely had something to do with memory. And most modern scholars, myself among them, are pretty clear that a Dharani is a mnemonic. Or a mnemonic device in that way. And so what starts to happen with a Dharani in the early days, in the early Bodhisattva days, is that a Dharani was considered a kind of, well, it would be a long string of syllables or a long string of words that were seemingly meaningless. And actually when the very first, and I'm talking like in the 1800s, early 1900s, when the first European English speaking scholars first started studying Dharanis, they actually called, just called them gibberish. They literally thought that they were meaningless strings of syllables. And they are in a sense, if you just read them, but that's actually supposedly what is part of their magic, if I can start to prime this conversation for how this happened, right? The idea is, is that yes, a mnemonic, if you're just looking at the mnemonic is kind of meaningless. It's the mnemonic's ability to, well, I mean, it's, it's magical for sure, but it's the mnemonic's ability to interact with the knowledge of the mind that is already present. And so the mnemonic jars the memory. So what a dharani seems to be is, oh, and, and it's helpful to know. So this is the, uh, De, this is the Devanagari. So this is the classical script form for which to write Sanskrit, but it is not the only way to write Sanskrit. In fact, I've written Sanskrit here using Roman letters. Point being Sanskrit is the language, the, the lang, the tongue, the language, all right? And you can write that language a lot of different ways. You can write it in Devanagari, you can write it in Simha, you can write it in uh, Sidham, you can write it in, in, like I said, in Roman script. You can write it in Chinese, actually. And so what I've written here are the three Chinese characters. 
that the Chinese used to transliterate the word da ra ni. Now in modern Mandarin, this is, this is the really dense, complicated portion of the evening, by the way, folks. In modern Mandarin, these three characters are pronounced tuo luo ni. And you might be thinking tuo luo ni, that doesn't sound anything like duran ni. You're right. But that's because these characters pronounced in the Mandarin way are the Mandarin way, which is a very kind of modern form of Chinese dialect, frankly. Cantonese is a little closer to medieval Chinese, but if you, if you have the resources, you can actually find the medieval, sometimes also called the middle period, Chinese pronunciation of these characters. And the, let me get my orientation right, the first Chinese character that is nowadays in Mandarin pronounced tuo was originally pronounced something more like da. The second one, luo, was actually originally pronounced ra. And the third character, ni. So, if you know the medieval pronunciation of these three characters, it's da, ra, ni. It's only in modern Mandarin that it doesn't sound like Durrani anymore. My point is, is that because these Dharanis are very much about syllables, very much about pronunciation and speaking, the Chinese had a really, really big problem in that they needed to transliterate Dharanis and mantras. They couldn't translate them because it wasn't about what they meant, it's about their sound. And so that difference right there is actually captured in this idea of the three character word Tuoloni, that is the Chinese word for Dharani but it's a transliteration. The Chinese do have a word for Durrani. So not a transliteration, but an actual two character word for Durrani. And that word, the, oh, I forget how to pronounce, is something like that. But those two characters, especially the second part, they relate to holding and memory. And as soon as you know that, oh, the idea of a Durrani as a mnemonic or a mnemonic device, it, it makes all the more sense. And so th that's sort of our beginning foundational understanding of these Duranis. They were mnemonic devices in that sense. They were sounds and they were syllables in that way. And they were, had something to do with the Bodhisattva path. But that's our next step on this, which is how does this all become part of the Bodhisattva path, right? Tanya, you have a question? Yeah, and maybe you said it and I missed it, but you know, if, the, if, the, if these were mnemonic devices, and so the sound was the most important thing, um, and they so they transliterated the the sound um, yep. in the Chinese. Would the mnemonics still work for all the when when, when they were trying to remember <clears throat> the the stuff the other stuff that was like translated Buddhist information into Chinese? And and, and if you don't want to go down that rabbit hole, that's fine. But I was just that was a thought. It's a great thought. It's a great question. Um. Yeah, hold on to it though. It has more to do with uh, as we get down the road, but you're, what you're thinking about is right on point is, as far as this idea of transliteration goes. Let's, let's dig a little deeper though. Any other questions while we're doing? Yeah, no. As, as usual, I had the same question as Tanya, but, but I added also a slightly different question, which is at some point, uh, 
language evolves, I think, even within a language, but certainly when a transliterate, when a, a mnemonic moves to another language, it evolves to take on meaning in and of itself, right? And and that's accelerated. I mean, that can happen within a single language, but it's accelerated when moving to another language, right? And yep. I'm thinking, I mean, since the beginning of the talk, I've been thinking about the word mantra, which this is slightly different, but the word, it's not. Because the word mantra can mean uh, reciting something full of meaning, like, you know, I will be happy today. I will be happy today. I, that could be considered a mantra, right? Where you say that over and over, or saying syllables that are, you know, gibberish, which often means they're coming from another language where they might have had meaning, they might have been mnemonics, and now they're just sounds. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. <laughs> both, uh, both Noam and Tanya's questions are so, it's like, you you should both go get PhDs because I mean, and I mean that because your questions are very right to the point. And in fact, it's what I it's a lot of the work I was doing in my graduate program. Um, and it's about that these mantras, these Dharanis, this whole tradition that we're talking about originated in one language family and made sense in that language family and then moved out of that language family. And both of your questions about what happens to the efficacy of the mnemonic, what happens to all that when you switch languages is exactly, that's the, exactly the history that needs to, to, in a way to be written, that hasn't been written, but it's what myself and a few other people are and we're looking at is that transition. And it's happening again, by the way, of course, this is, I relate this to everybody too, that the reason why I did my graduate studies the way I did by looking at medieval China is that I noticed that they, they had gotten Buddhism, were poke, poked around with it for a few hundred years and then finally made it their own. And I recognize that we Americans are in the same process where we have encountered it about a hundred years ago. We've been poking around at it for a while we're developing our own understanding of it and we're about to produce our own form of Buddhism in a way. And I wanted to, as a scholar, wanted to study a culture that had already done that because I kind of always like to know where things are going in that way. So again, the questions about Dharanis and mantras as they transition from the Indic family to the East Asian family of languages, it's the same thing happening again in English where like, and it happens a lot even in these Buddhist Dharanis and mantras where they're being pronounced either maybe in Japanese or in Chinese or Mongolian or in English. And the question of, do they still work? That's the question. So hold on to that idea though. So, okay, I got a few more. This is gonna be uh, definitely multi-part on the Dharani. Um, let me, so let me, let's see. So there's two directions. Let's see, I got a half hour. There's two directions to go. We can probably do both of these. So on the, yeah, these are two different directions. So we're gonna do one pause and then do the other. So the first one, it goes back to mnemonics, memory, retention. It's another aspect of Dharani. It's about retention, the retaining of information. So according to Nagarjuna and his Mahapranyaparamita Shastra, there are these different types of Dharanis. And What the first entry, I'll get actually, I'll give you a few of these. The first entry that he gives is riffing off of Nagarjuna gives this, he's riffing off of the etymology of the word. And he says that the word Durrani means capable of holding, but it also means capable of preventing. And what he ties that into without 
relating to the whole thing is he says these Durranis basically help the Bodhisattva retain the information that they have learned. Like that's the first entry. Flowing off of that, number two, the second entry, it's like a dictionary, the second way the word is used. The Bodhisattva who possesses Dharani is able to retain and not forget all the teachings that they have heard by the power of their memory. And the reason why I focus on that one is in the early days of this, there was this very close association between Dharanis and memory. Dharanis were considered these mnemonics and so on and so forth. However, relating this to, uh, so our friend Jason related the Milarepa story, which was the more magical story about the snow. So that is going to be, like I said, much, much later but a very early version of Dharani's and memory and magic. A very, very early practice was that there were certain Dharani's and I, try, I wanted to find one because I, I, but I couldn't find the actual Dharani, the actual incantation, but there are a few of them and it goes something like this. Um, th actually, the story is, is that there's a very famous Japanese Buddhist monk from around the year 800 or so. He's over in Japan and he got a hold of a Dharani. And that Durrani that he got a hold of in Japan in the, in the ninth century, it said that if he was told actually that if he chanted that Durrani a million times, he would develop, there's a word for it. Um, I had it on notes, but it's a, it's a word for perfect memory, total recall the ability to remember everything you read, everything you hear. This monk, Kukai, Kukai, ninth century Japanese Buddhist monk, did this and basically claims, oh, this works. Meaning he claims that it worked. And so that actually kind of sent him on a journey to China to learn more about these Dharanis and to learn more about Dharani practice. And Kukai is this Buddhist monk who is attributed with bringing the tantric Vajrayana, he called it Mantrayana, actually, the mantra path. Kukai is attributed with bringing this tradition to Japan and founding what is called the Shingon school. The Shingon is Japanese for mantra. The word mantra, at least according to most, means truth speech, true words. Mantras are true. They're not false speech in that way. So I relate this story to you about Kukai because it really encapsulates early Durrani practice. They were chants, they were mantras in that way. They were part of a, um, a recitation tradition, you know. Um, by the way, if you're gonna chant a Durrani a million times, you better have a good rosary in order to keep track of all of those. So you, what I'm kind of suggesting is you can start to see a relationship between the mala beads, the rosary beads and mantra recitation, but it's because they were dealing with reciting these things thousands and thousands of times and you needed your counter bead to keep track of all of that. So Kukai goes and brings this whole tradition back to Japan and it goes on and becomes the Japanese esoteric Vajrayana tradition. 
but it all started with a Durrani, is my point. And the Durrani was both a mnemonic, but the efficacy of the mnemonic was to bring about better memory. So it starts to get really complicated in that way. And what I'm actually trying to do tonight is just like pound the themes so that we don't get <clears throat> too distracted with, with things. And say, oh, this is about memory. This is about syllables. It's about words. It's about all of that. So that's sort of one way to think about Durrani's, at least in their medieval practice, is that they were at first, at least if we take Kukai's example, they were these like <clears throat> memory aids, memory devices, and maybe with a hint of magic, right? That they would like do something kind of magical. <clears throat> but the whole point of that, like especially for this monk Kukai is, I mean, if you read Kukai's biography, Kukai's a really interesting historical figure, but if you read Kukai's bi biography, he was burning the midnight oil in the libraries. Like, you know, he really was a student in that way. And so when he found out that there was this little trick to improve his memory, he did it seemingly so that he could keep studying. <laughs> like it wasn't an end in itself, but I'm, what I'm saying is you can start to see how that might become an end unto itself. Just the magical efficacy of a Durrani and not using it in its full bodhisattva power in that way. All right. So that's the first thing that I, the first fork I wanted to finish was Durrani's as memory aids, devices, something like that. All right. Okay. Totally different vein. Okay. But yeah, I, wa I, I wanted to do that first to, to sort of plant those ideas. So the other thing, and this will pretty much probably take us through the end of tonight, but who knows? It goes back actually to what I read from the big mother of all sutras, where the Buddha says about these Dharanis, that these Dharanis, it's about the sameness or equality of all letters and syllables. It's about the sameness or the equality of all spoken words. Dharanis are the syllable doors. They are the syllable entrances. And what I mean is, is that that idea of the association with Dharanis and the equality, I want to actually say the equality of all dharmas, but in this case, the equality of all syllables, the equality of all language. There's a very, very interesting, beautiful place in all of that. It's, it's a really magical place where all of those ideas combined. And I want to tell you, so you all know, I hope you all know, that this, the mother of all Pranyaparamita Sutras, the large Pranyaparamita Sutra, of course has a slightly smaller, a slightly smaller version in just 8,000 lines, right? It's a little more reduced, it's a little smaller, but it's still a, a decent size. Not quite as big as this, but still a good size. And there's actually even smaller versions of the Pranya Paramita Sutra. They get, they get down to one that is so small, it's like 800 lines, or so, and that's called the Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Pranya Paramita Sutra, polished to a diamond, they will say. They will say, right? But of course, the Pranya Paramita Sutra in 18,000 lines or 8,000 lines or 800 lines, 
it gets even smaller. And of course, one of the smallest versions of the Pranya Paramita Sutra is called the Pranya Paramita Heart Sutra, otherwise just known as the Heart Sutra. 14 little lines, 14 shlokas. And of course, what is beloved about the Heart Sutra is that somehow all of the information that is in this giant 18,000 line mother of all sutras is actually in the Heart Sutra. The, all the information is in the Heart Sutra. And if you didn't know, all of the information of the Heart Sutra, which is all the information of the large Pranipara Sutra, is actually contained in the tiny mantra at the end of the Heart Sutra. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisvaha. That is considered a Dharani, by the way. It is called a mantra, but in other contexts, it is most certainly a Dharani. And it's considered a Dharani because it is a mnemonic for the Heart Sutra in some capacity. It is a condensation of the meaning of the Heart Sutra, which is already a condensation of the meaning of the Pranyaparamita Sutra. And just when you thought, wow, really, Michael? The whole Maha Pranyaparamita Sutra in Aum Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisvaha? But there actually is one version of the Maha Pranyaparamita Sutra that's even smaller than that. Let's see, I happen to have a version of it right here. That's the Mahapranya Paramita Sutra in one letter. And that's the Sanskrit letter A, or just A. In, in fact, I did, I've, been working, I've been working on a translation of the Mahapranya Paramita Sutra in one letter, and I've gotten it down to this. So this is the Mahapranya Paramita Sutra in one letter. And indeed, there is a version of the Mahapranya Paramita Sutra in which it says, thus have I heard, once the Buddha was staying on, in Rajgriha at the Vulture's Peak with the great assembly of, of bhikshus and bodhisattvas, and at that time, the Buddha said, oh, and everybody was delighted. And that was the end of the sutra. So again, this is the best I could do in English of a translation of, let's see it again, that sutra. So just the letter. So even just in my retelling, of the story of the origin of the smallest Pranyaparamita Sutra, I hope you can start to see how this makes sense. Meaning the whole Dharani, mnemonic, matrix, matrika, packing of information, right? So that's what I want to kind of talk about tonight. It's really how, or for the rest of tonight, it's really how all of this it comes together in a really interesting way. Knowledge, language, all of these different ideas. And, you know, what's going on with this is interesting. So it has to do, you know, I want to give you a feel for how these Dharanis might work. Okay. And the idea of this is, and it ha it's very related to the philosophy, if you will, or the, the wisdom of the pranya. It's why I keep mentioning that this is the Maha Pranya Paramita Sutra or the small Pranya Paramita Sutra. This is all about pranya, wisdom, but transcendent wisdom. And a big chunk of transcendent wisdom 
is so I, I often mention this sutra, this sutra a lot. And what I mean is, is that there's sort of two, arguably three different things going on here. So one is you may be seeing this as the letter A versus, you know, just seeing it as a shape. This is what in Buddhism we would just call the realm of pure form. You, you got a form, but you know, whatever, it's some lines. Oh, wow, it's another letter. Wait, hold on, hold on. And we're back. So my point is, is that you can see slanted, slanted, straight. It, you could see that just as a shape. And if you're just seeing it as a shape, then that's a shape. That's what that is. But if you are seeing the letter A, then there's a way in which you could imagine that this looks something a little bit like this in your mind. And what I mean by that is, is that insofar as you are conceiving of this as a letter, in particular, the first letter of the alphabet, then it actually in your mind is this, a, a matrix of understanding. In other words, the letter A is 1 26th of a meaning matrix that you know you learned this, you were conditioned, you were taught, you learned this. And now when you see a shape that looks like this, it can unpack the letter B, the letter C, D, E, F, G, all the way to the letter Z, because that's what the letter A is. If you're literate and know how to read, then the letter A is the letter B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. It, it contains those other letters and it has to contain those other letters in order to be the letter A because that's what the letter A is. A, right? So if you're following me on that idea that even though I'm looking at a letter A, if I think of it as the letter A, it's actually the other letters of the alphabet. There's a way in which this kind of magic of perception and epistemology and knowledge, there's a way in which this, in, in other words, what I'm kind of trying to drive you towards is noticing that language is already mnemonic and magical. It's already playing at a very subtle mind level. And it's kind of actually miraculous that we can communicate with one another and talk, frankly. It's bananas. <laughs> and actually, so what, you know, what I think is interesting about these Duranis is it's not actually like or the way I think about them, let me be clear about that. The way I think about them, it's not, it's not that there's like a, a higher, more magical level that Duranis give one access to. I think it's actually about these Duranis revealing the magical aspect to the world we already live in, which is language-based. That in a way we take for granted and Durrani's and mantra work remind us of how powerful speech is in that way, if that makes sense. Questions, comments, answers, an idea about that. The shortest, smallest sutra. Yeah, no. S starting from the 
awe and going back toward the Maha Pranya Paramita Sutra through all the successive longer ones instead of going the other direction. Yep. The I can think of the awe uh, as a mnemonic for the Heart Sutra and then the Heart Sutra as a mnemonic for the next sutra and so on and so forth. And so that awe uh, is con contains them all in this sense. But only if I know all the others, like it's a reminder of them or it points to them, but it, so, but, or does it at some point come to stand for them so that all I'd have to know is I, do you know what I'm asking? Does that make sense? I, I do know what you're asking. And your question is perfect for a point that I was not going to make. I totally forgot. So let's go back to the beginning of the talk where I was really making a point of these Dharanis in the original sense are these attainments of the Bodhisattva. They're like samadhis that way, where they you reach a certain point of Bodhisattva development and you attain these Dharanis. And it's kind of like, well, what does that mean? So the first thing about that is while, while the longer history of Dharanis shows that these got reduced to magic spells. And so what, what are Dharanis? They're magic spells. And here's an example of one. Om gate gate paragate paragate bodhisvaha. That's, you know, and what is in more interesting is to go back to think of these Dharanis as attainments of a bodhisattva. And what I mean is, is that, by the way, if I didn't mention it at the, at the beginning, these Dharanis, they're always basically the last thing developed by the bodhisattva. In the, in the Mahapranya Paramita Sutra, as I read, the bodhisattva develops a lot of other equipment and supplies. And at the end, it's the Dharanis. In other words, I think that there is, and I don't want to jump too much all over the place. I know, I realize I'm already starting to do that, which is the possible original meaning of these things, a more medieval use that's interesting, and then a later magic incantations, magic spells, period. So those are our three periods, and I'm deep in this, like, where do these things come from? Originally, they were attainments. And without getting, because I have a lot of notes here that I'm not getting into. So without going through all of those notes, I think that there's a very interesting relationship between upaya and dharani. And what I mean by that is, is that if you understand upaya as skillful means, but if you understand upaya as a particular bodhisattva attainment, a particular bodhisattva skill, and if you understand then that an upaya is a, you know, it could be a simile, it could be a parable, it could be a metaphor, it could be a lot. In fact, you don't even know, but the bodhisattva will choose the right example for the right person at the right time which will then deliver the teaching and the knowledge of what is the right parable at the right time to the right person. It's all about timing and knowing who you're talking to and all of that. So the wild, beautiful thing about upaya is that it is never, upaya are never prescribed. They're never pre, like pre-written. They truly, in order to be upaya, they must arise in the moment. So upaya are these particular, you know, skills of a bodhisattva. And so are dharanis, it would seem. And so what dharanis are, seemingly, if we read all the early information, they seem to be these sort of ways that a bodhisattva was able to remember everything. 
and I don't mean everything, everything, although again, the some Durrani's claim that you can memorize everything, everything, but I'm speaking more about, you know, frankly, I wanna speak more uh, honestly from a place of, of um, as a teacher, as somebody who's been teaching Buddhism and Dharma for many, many years now, I can tell you that I have developed these, I don't know if they're Durrani, but you know, in my own knowledge, there's ways that I can, you know, I can spit the eightfold path off the top of my head. I can spit the 12 link chains off the top of my head. I can, I can actually recite a lot of things off the top of my head. And I'm not claiming any supernatural ability at that. This is truly just years and years and years and years and years and years of study and learning. But in the process of that, I don't, again, I don't know if they're quite Durrani, but I do know a few tricks to encapsulate information for myself and maybe for others that then can be kind of unpacked. And that's definitely a part of a Durrani. It's not an upaya, so it's not a simile or a parable or a metaphor. It's more of a matrix. It's more of one of those lists of lists. But when you have those lists of lists in your back pocket, it's very easy to unpack the Dharma. And in fact, that what I was getting at with the um, smallest sutra is that type of unpacking aspect to knowledge, right? Speaking of which, in terms of unpacking knowledge, there's a really beautiful idea. It's not a Buddhist idea, although it gets related to Buddhism a lot, and it should definitely get related to Durrani's a lot. There's a beautiful idea in that comes from the Roman, kind of the Greco-Roman tradition. Many of you probably know it, but it's the idea of a memory palace. If you haven't heard of a memory palace, a memory palace is a very, very old Greco-Roman practice. And it's a technique, it's a mnemonic memorizing technique. And it's a memorizing technique that it was usually employed by reciters, people who were in the business of reciting epic poems, long, large amounts of information. So we are talking before computers, before the cloud, right? Before memory, uh, by which I you know, mean hard drives. People memorize incredible vast amounts of information. And one technique for doing that in the Greco-Roman tradition was called a memory palace. And what a memory palace was, was that you would actually build in your mind a house or a building or a palace, even many rooms. And that palace might have a foyer, it might have like an entry and then a staircase going up, going left, going right. And the idea is, is that you could then begin to do a process of association with a large body of information that you wanted to memorize. And so let's say the large body of information that you wanted to memorize was a poem and it was broken into stanzas, hundreds and hundreds of stanzas, right? Well, there's a way in which you could place the first stanza in the lobby of your memory palace and associate certain words of that stanza, the, the first lines of the stanza, you would associate them with uh, aspects of your memory palace, whether it's furniture, art on the wall, or what have you. What this eventually does is it's kind of a, um, it translates the information that you want to remember into mind stuff, 
because your memory palace is made of mind. And so when you make those associations, you sort of create this matrix that I'm talking about. And what that does is that it, so let's say you go through this process and you memorize this poem in association with your memory palace. Years later, you haven't thought about this poem forever. All you need to do is mentally walk into your foyer of your memory palace and look to your right, because maybe in your memory palace, you always enter and turn to your right. And right there, you will find the first word of the first line of the poem. And as soon as you remember the first word, you will know, oh, right, the second word, the third word, the fourth or lines or whatever. And there's a way that the mnemonic of your memory palace will unpack the poem that you already know, but you packed it away in your memory palace. So that's the Greco-Roman tradition of building this memory palace, but it's very related to what it seems like this early Bodhisattva tradition of Dharanis, of either, and this is where I wanna like, yeah, I wanna complicate this a little bit. Nobody really knows, it, there's no clear evidence about whether bodhisattvas were given these dharanis by their like teacher or somebody, or if they actually sort of made them up themselves. And by reaching that certain point, they create dharani, dharanis that are their uh, memory devices or memory aids in that way. questions, comments, answers, ideas about that idea of the Durrani as a memory palace. <laughs> All right. So what happens is, and this is sort of just the last, I, I have so many more things I wanted to talk about. One thing really quickly, Get, get ready, by the way. Yeah. So imagine, imagine I had a long poem that I wanted to memorize. So let's say I took the first letter of the first word, or sorry, the first letter of every word of the poem. So now I have all the first letters and that would make a very long string of syllables. And then let's say I figured out some sort of way of taking all of those letters and as far as the repetitions of letters, when certain letters repeated, I could come up with a, a very, very simple notation to indicate that that was the second occurrence of that letter, the third occurrence and so on. So now my very long string of syllables or letters has gotten smaller because I've managed to reduce duplication in that way. Now, imagine I were to take all of those first letters reduced down to just the letter and then the number of occurrences of that letter. And then let's say I were to create a kind of symbol that looked a little bit like those letters, but I sort of used my notation for the recurrences and I use to create this kind of weird symbol. And it would be, you could almost look at it as one crazy letter that is that whole poem. And like I've kind of been dancing around all night talking about, if you already knew that poem, you could look at that symbol and be like, oh, that's right. And the whole poem could be unpacked from that one weird looking letter symbol thing, right? That one weird letter symbol looking thing, right? So that right there, I kind of, I have so much more, but I can't. So I want to leave you with that idea of 
that sort of process of reducing information down to this kind of um, actually in the Greek tradition, they have a word for this. It's called a logo. And I mean, the logos is deep, you know, read your Greek Bible and you'll know how deep the logos goes. So logos is deep, but the English word logo, like a corporate logo comes from this Greek idea of a logos, which comes from the idea I just described of, of, of imagine one symbol that stood for the whole poem that again, if the mind were the right mind could actually unpack that. But if the mind didn't know it, it would be an obscure symbol. And that is the beginning of the esoteric hidden nature of Durrani's, right? So that'll be where we go next week is how did these turn into magic? How did these turn into magic spells, right? Well, that's an indicator. So <laughs> that's it. Pages and pages of notes that we'll have to wait. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here.